Do we drop? So we're all set. Okay. Um, so welcome. We we welcome the Zoom participants. Welcome the people in the audience. We have a, a fairly short agenda today. We have we're going to start with public comment. Then we're going to have a public hearing for some proposed zoning ordinance amendments. Um, and then we have a couple of housekeeping duties at the end. Um, so we'll start with public comment. This time is open to anybody who would like to address the planning board about any issues in the city, um, issues that are not on the agenda today. If you're here for the zoning ordinances, you might wanna wait for those comments till then. But anything else, please feel free to come to the podium. And we'll ask for your name and address just for the record. Hi, Nancy Smith, Chapel Street. First, I'd like to thank the board for pulling back on a rezone of the entire metrics block last fall, as well as Director Mission of the City Council for their strong support of keeping the PV rezone to the metrics parcels at 31 Chapel Street. All agreed there was no reason to rezone the block. The house on 33 Chapel was saved, and we are grateful. However, on the agenda tonight is part one of unnecessarily creating a reason to expand the PD district to 33. I'm asking the board and director Mish to again step up to protect our lower and middle income neighborhood by rejecting the 3133 Chapel ANR land swap. The bike shed on 31 can easily be moved to a much better location on its lot. The bottom of 33's unpaved driveway can be moved uh, a sliver away from 31. The garage is way bigger than the house, and that swing can be made. So why a land swap that makes a small sliver of 33 PV? It's a ploy for expanding the PV district to 33, while only a small percent of the parcel uh, keeping 33, uh, well, only a small percent of the parcel, uh, well, it is only, sorry, a small percent of the parcel keeping 33 in the URB district and zoned URB. Part two is coming up on March 23rd by a 31 Chapel site plan and special per uh, permit. Page seven of 31 Chapel's 22 unit site plan adds the nearly completed separate 33 Chapel refurbed house to its project site and then details the intent to expand Plan Village District to the entire project site, which then includes the house at 33 Chapel. PV zoning was created for major projects like redeveloping the old state hospital property. PV used on an existing residential neighborhood will paint a big red profit bullseye on our lower and middle income homes and rentals for builders to exploit. Zero parking, for example, is okay in PV, which allows builders far greater freedom to tear down affordable homes and rentals and build whatever they want with very little oversight or limitation. Home prices uh, and rents skyrocket. This is the housing crisis. A bit down the road when the home at 35 Chapel sells, the profit bullseye will make the refurbed home at 33 valuable enough for a builder to make the brand new owner an offer he can't refuse. Then there is a reason to rezone PV for a major project, knocking down two small single family homes that young people might have had a shot at, but a builder can and will outbid them. This opens the affordable four family behind 35 for a rezone and massively profitable tear down, tear down leaving renters out in the cold. This is the housing crisis. I'm asking Director Mish and the board to once again protect the owners and renters of our low and middle income neighborhood by rejecting the 3133 ANR tonight and by rejecting 31 Chapel site plan and special permit on March 23rd if the addition of 33 Chapel and the attempt to expand the planned village district are not removed. If you do, some young people may have a prayer of owning a home or renting there someday. We don't want to slow down the 31 Chapel project. We want it as soon as possible. We object only to the PV district expansion. Thank you. And I just want to mention RLLs can be exploited as well. A border to border McMansion in place of a fixer upper home uh, is, a, is it the housing crisis as well. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Oops. Good evening. I'm Jackie Ballance from Florence, uh, 35 Warner Street. I, I can remember where I live. Um, I gave you the handout uh, for reference here. I want to start with a quick review of the planning board meeting from September the 10th, 8th rather, of last year. Uh, for the benefit of Chairman Kohat, who was absent from that meeting. Did you take a vacation? Uh-huh. Um, 
Although Nancy Smith came to Chambers to speak for her neighborhood at that meeting, her voice was essentially ignored. When I read the minutes of that meeting, it merely says that she read a prepared statement. It says nothing about the content of her statement. And the video of that meeting was not saved, so there's no way we can ever know what she said. Because of the acoustics, I didn't hear what she said, and I was watching on Zoom. I saw the board members look at the map of the um, parcel. And uh, one of the board members, who's absent tonight, said, well, why can't we put the PV line down here on Laurel Street? Because that would make a nice straight line on the map, and it would be much easier to draw. And Director Mish said, well, we can't change the proposal at this time, but we can fix it the next time. I was disappointed that absolutely no consideration was voiced with a living, breathing, working, tax paying residents of this neighborhood who would be directly impacted psychologically and financially by the expansion of PV down to Laurel Street. No care was shown for existing residents whatsoever. And that's why the discussion at the city council meeting in October was focused on drawing the PV line strictly between parcels 31 and 33 Chapel Street. And there were reassurances that PV zoning would not extend beyond the old metrics lot where I used to take my Austin Marina back in the 70s. Um, yeah, so you've got the assessor's map there. You've, you've got the site plan there. The neighborhood, you can see the swap in the little red circles and how the boundary line jogs first into 33 and then back over into 31, swapping between URB and PV zones. The so-called swap of the parcels is very disturbing. The builder has told the neighbors in person just last week that he's fine with adjusting the placement of his bicycle storage unit, which is the top one, and the driveway, which is the bottom swap, it's not built yet, so everything is still flexible on the picture. He's, he, this isn't his idea. I, we don't know where it came from. But it looks like a betrayal of an agreement that neighbors and counselors made in good faith back in October. It looks like the planning board is making a gesture to the neighborhood that says, y'all can do whatever you want you'll eventually get the PV all the way to Laurel Street, whether the neighbors like it or not. That's what it looks like. I'm saying that's not what it is. That's what it looks like. Please prove me wrong. Thank you very much. All right, are there any other comments? Um, so because we, with the folks in Zoom, if you have a comment, you can certainly use the chat function to notify either the chair or myself, and we'll read your comments out loud. Raise your hand using the uh, toolbar at the bottom or? Only chat. Only chat, okay. Raise your hand to say you sent a chat. No chats? No chat. Okay, all right. Well, at this point then, we'll, we'll move on to our first item of business, which is proposed zoning ordinance amendments. And so we have a package, quite a, a quite a few of them. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, what we do with these zoning amendments is at the end of our discussion, we decide to uh, kind of recommend, we make a recommendation. We don't really vote on the amendments, but we make a recommendation to the city council. Is that correct? Right. So the um, <clears throat> all zoning ordinances come to the planning board for public hearing and legislative matters, which is a subcommittee of city council. And um, each of those bodies makes a recommendation to the full city council and then full city council um, confers and um, deliberates about the recommendations before making a decision. So this is the first step for both of these um, packages and the legislative matters um, hearing for item one, which we'll go over first, is is going to be on Monday, 
And so then that package, if legislative, if you all and legislative matters both um, make recommendations um, between now and the end of Monday, that will go back to city council next week. The other one will be, um, won't go to legislative matters till the April meeting. Um, the first is, that, so I can go over the first, the big package, which is uh, all about sort of tweaks and modifications to the form-based code that was adopted last spring. We knew that there would probably be these little things that popped up that we didn't um, catch or think about. And right away we saw them. And so we sort of sat on them and waited because we figured there'd be some more that might come to light. And um so, and I also want to um, thank um, Councillor Jarrett for <clears throat> running through the code afterwards and saying, oh, what about this? What about that? So a lot of the items in this package um, are because he found these um, um, items that need to be clarified. The um, There are several items in that package that went to city council that are non-zoning uh, amendments. So we're not going to talk about those today because planning board only has jurisdiction over the zoning items. I mean, you can't, we can talk about them, but you don't need to make a recommendation on them because they're not zoning. Um, so the three, the items that are zoning I've placed on the agenda, the rest of them that still, I think was in your packet, but they're the ones that are non-zoning items. So the first one is, um, Chapter 350, Section 7.9, and it's about where sandwich board signs are allowed. Um, let me just pop this up. Got it in here. Okay. Um, and it just, the section, um, we missed it when we were going through. So it, it has old references to the Central Business District and um, the General uh, Florence center or general business district. So it just inserts the new map um, identification. So central business core, side street and gateway, and then Florence village center and general district. So that's that one. Uh, do you want me to run through all of these before you discuss, or do you want to discuss each one? Um, sure. Sure, we can run through them. I think they're all pretty standard, yeah. you know, a lot of Florence Village Center. And yeah, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> eight one is the parking section, and um, the Gateway District for parking, we just didn't identify the um, uh, parking requirements in that district. Um, and then again, sort of creating clarification about references about central business district where there are no parking requirements for the core and side street district. Um, and then moving into the um, more of the coding part, um, this next section deals with um, the code section itself, form based code. And this is to insert um, a, a, an allowed use that includes um, marijuana cultivation, production, sort of at a small scale, less than 5,000 square feet of um, cumulative square footage of growing area. No portion of such use shall be, um, shall front on a public way. Uses may only occur at the back of a building or in a building behind another building. And then all such spaces for production and manufacturing must incorporate high efficiency particulate air, air handlers with activated carbon filters and exhaust systems designed with vents that force the air at least 10 feet above the roof line of the building. Alternative technology may be used upon fi a finding by the planning board through site plan approval that such technology will, uh, to the extent practical, limit odors from marijuana in any place where the public or clients are present. So um, the rationale behind this, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so I thought we as a planning board discussed these kind of definitions before when talking about marijuana, but now we're just adding, inserting them into the tables for clarity. So, so um, what happened, so yes, part to part A. <laughs> um, however, 
And so the sort of going backwards, the rationale about um, separating where marijuana cultivation could happen and where sales of marijuana could happen um, was based on um, presumption that most production and cultivation is going to be um, large scale plus um, required to be in buildings that um, are mostly walled up, no windows because they want to control air, light, ventilation, and all of that in a controlled facility. And so it was deemed at the time going back four, four years that it would be appropriate to allow those in the industrial districts and at the planned village district because the industrial uses are allowed. Um, and then sales where um, people are, it's retail, really. You want that in your commercial districts. Um, so all of that's been identified, uh, sort of separated in the code. Um, there's sort of this newer uh, provision at the state level in the CCC, Cannabis Control Commission has this um, micro enterprise category that includes all of it in one. So cultivation and packaging and potentially sales or delivery. But it's a it's the focus of it is um, for very small um, you, um, entrepreneurs and their special categories of entrepreneurs. So we looked at that um, and because it's small scale and then even within that piece, um, if you get a license under that level, you your actual cultivation area is even smaller than 5,000 square feet because you also have to have room to um, process and package and have an office and all of that stuff. Um, so we felt like in certain circumstances, it might make sense because if it also includes a, re a retail component, you want that in the commercial districts. So nowhere had we addressed this particular sort of category um, in the zoning. And so we felt like maybe in some instances, cultivation would be okay in the commercial core of Florence and downtown. And so that's why these caveats are there. So back of a building where window and street front visibility is not um, necessary. You know, we it's similar to allowing how we started allowing residential on the first floor if it were in the back, because we wanted to maintain sort of storefront windows for pedestrian and, and public private interface along the street front and pedestrian, you know, energized pedestrian activity. So this is sort of follows along that same line to allow these in the back. The footnote is the same language we use in the industrial districts for production. And that's to address the smell yep. that comes off of that. So this language is already in the zoning. We just yep. want to make sure we're copying it into these districts. So that's the reason for this. Um, amendment and it would it would be allowed then in all the form based code districts um with this sort of narrow definition thank you <clears throat> um the last one again is sort of a cleanup um mobile food vehicles are um are, aren't allowed in the central business district um and it previously said florence zoned general business and so some of that's not zoned gb anymore um, we want to change the text there to reflect um, that the concept hasn't changed. We don't want them in down in Florence Village cent um, Center or downtown, unless it's on private property. They can't be on public streets. That's what this is about. And um, oh, this is that's it for the zoning. The rest of them, I'd be happy to walk through, but they're in other parts of the code that are non-zoning. And again, it's mostly just um, adding the new uh, zoning classification labels where they didn't exist before. It's one, two, three, four in zoning. <clears throat> oh, no. I was just going to ask, I don't one, see two, the three. fourth one on the agenda. It's three. Food truck one the right food here. truck one is not, and I apologize. So. Ah, okay. Just three. Because I wanted to open up that whole can of worms about food. You can go on Monday oh. to legislative matters. Can I do that? Okay. Can I just ask about the off-street parking one? 
So it seems like the categories are in central business, CBC and mm -hmm. CBS, uh -huh. one space per. And then the next thing says all districts, including CBG, one space per. So shouldn't it? So does that mean also CBC and CBS? Because it says all mm -hmm. districts, including CBG? No, the, the way it's supposed to read is there are two categories. Either you're in central business core or central business side street, or you're in all other districts, but that also- Right, it doesn't say all other districts. It says all districts. So maybe I'm proposing that it say all other districts. Oh, the keep CBG. other in there. Got it. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I would makes... insert other in between the words all and districts, maybe. All, all other, other districts, districts, including CBG. Okay, that makes sense. That's that's Thank my you. only note on yeah, any of these. Yep. Good catch. So, and I guess I might say, is this an opportunity for us to discuss kind of the minimal minimum parking that we have in zoning? And <clears throat> um, no parking requirement. Um, in the central business, we never we did not have parking requirements, so it carries over to the new form based code mm -hmm. and includes the side street districts, which right. previously was also mostly central business anyway. The gateway district and Florence Center used to be the general business zone, and in general business. You didn't have to have parking if you added a second story to a building that was one story or for the reuse of built of a space, you didn't have to recalculate. But if you added footprint square footage, then just for that footprint, you would be required to provide parking. And we did not open up the conversation about that during the form-based code because there were so many other aspects of the form-based code that were changing and um, over the years, there's been concern about um, Florence um, having or wanting to have different parking um, provisions than downtown Northampton. So sort of to George point, George's point and yours, certainly we can, it, it might be a good time to have the conversation. I think it may be, this might be a time where you flag it and say, let's come back to that. Um, you can't, it's not advertised as making a change to the parking um, requirements the now, the table. Yeah. So you couldn't make the change through this um, advertised amendment, but we could come back. And I think frankly, it, makes more sense to have just a focused conversation about what we want to do with parking throughout the city. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So consider it flag then. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if I have an interest in broadening some of the flexibility around food trucks, I need to go to the legislative matters committee because that's not within our purview. Okay. Uh, So then we're looking at three zoning, three 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 zoning amendments. Yeah. Okay. Um, I might just ask on the marijuana one when we're adding that new language. Uh -huh. Marijuana production of small scale less than five thousand. Does this always trigger a special permit or a site plan review? No, it's allowed by right, uh -huh. unless, of course, you're building a new building that's over 2,000 square feet, and then that would be site plan. Okay. Or if the applicant wanted to um, come to the board with an alternative means of dressing odor, then that would trigger site plan, and they'd have to come before you and show you that what they're proposing accomplishes equal or yeah. better than what the standard is. But if they're in an existing footprint, they're reusing that space, right. then it would just be by right. By right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the odor only apply to indoors or outside? Indoors. Okay. The only allowance for outdoor growing. No, I meant like if they're venting outside, I guess it's going to 
filtration system. So yeah. So no, no, no. I'm sorry. It's for venting the indoor odors to outside. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this I'm just is wondering if odors will be, you know, found outside, but I guess that's something that that's what we're trying to prevent with this. Right. Yeah. That's why this um, is attempting to yeah. sort of address that based on um, what we understand for, you know, what can, how it can filter mm -hmm. those air. Yeah. And who enforces that? Right. Well, so when they come for the building permit, they need to show their system. Yeah. And so then that becomes part of their building okay. permit review. And their and inspection. Uh, am I wrong? I don't think we have a marijuana production site in Northampton at this point. We permitted one up in. We have extractions and um, <clears throat> and actually, there's one under development in um, the Yankee Machine. Oh, right. Building at the back. So we right have now. we have no data yet about odors and this carbons. <laughs> Yeah. The carbon treatment, maybe other cities too, but we don't yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I've heard about good site lighting, like uh, about security lights and stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't think about that? Yeah. Yeah. Candles in. <laughs> we did permit that large one up in the old uh, um, quarry area, but that just hasn't come through no. up by. Yeah. Fred's Variety Store. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, other questions about either one, two, or three? So we could. Carolyn, can you? I, I have a question. Could you just repeat again the um, <clears throat> the language about the venting? You said it was borrowed from um, other parts of the zoning where this is allowed, which was industrial and where else? General business? No, office industrial, general industrial, and the planned village district. Okay. Is where is currently the only place where you can do marijuana manufacturing, production, cultivation. Okay. I guess my only question about the ten feet putting this in, uh, possibly in central business, and with the uh, change that I think form based code brought along that there could, as you said, be housing in the back. And then you end up with these different sized buildings that 10 feet above one building could be below the window of someone else, which is not something that you would encounter in an industrial zone. So um, anyway, I don't, I, I understand the consistency of um, carrying over the identical language, but I wonder if this might actually potentially have more impact in these kind of mixed use neighborhoods. Um, yeah, we don't have data here for sure. Um, I'm just going to pull up that language again. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. But right, an alternative would to say that it would have to be 10 feet higher than the roof line of an adjoining. Yeah, which and a that, butter. that probably doesn't. And then I don't. Same, like a, like a 60 foot. Yeah. 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 If they build higher, you could build this. This is how it's going to be. Like this is the Interesting. I don't know. Right. Nobody's saying that you can use the technology. Yeah. It's really just about the outcome. Yeah. Never know what you run into when you're doing research for zoning ordinances. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess a butters could ask for the uh, the the stack to be monitored in some way. I'm not sure how. I know a chart pack for a while had a big problem up in Leeds with very noxious fumes, and they were able to monitor it um, to kind of get them to do a a, a more sophisticated scrubber system. Um, and I guess that would be up to the building inspector then to work with the butter or the to kind of this isn't a danger though it's just that it's a potentially a nuisance but it's nothing worse than like if you had a like if you live near a kitchen dryer you have the butcher plate oh, like, man. Like, oh. yeah and it <clears throat> it makes Northampton like Burgerville yeah nice. okay <clears throat> thanks Jenna mm -hmm. other questions okay 
right. Um, so is there a motion about uh, to recommend these forward to? See if there's any public comment. I don't see anybody. Oh, that's right. That's a public hearing. Yep. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on the zoning amendments? Or anyone in the Zoom who would like to? I don't see any chats. Okay. Very good. Is there a motion then to close the public hearing? I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. Thanks. The motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Any opposed? Okay. Unanimous. So we had a chance to ask our, our resident expert, zoning expert, all of our questions. Okay. And these are going to be forwarded on to the legislative matters this meeting on Monday, and then no, not le yeah. Yeah, legislative matters, yeah. and then on to the city council. <clears throat> so, is there a motion to uh, recommend these three changes, these three amendments? I'll uh, <clears throat> move to recommend these three proposed zoning ordinance amendments. With the uh, with that one change with the all other districts the parking yes but that one change which was number two yeah clarified parking performance okay two, right? yep and all of these adopted changes are related to the form based code our new form based code a second all right motions are made and seconded any discussion okay um all those in favor any opposed? All right. Unanimous. Good luck, legislative matters, with your public hearing. Uh, initially, we talked about doing one of these combined hearings, you know, so everybody could do it all at person, time, but it didn't work out. Well, that was the problem. <laughs> um, well, when central business meets, they're in person. Um, I think the I think there are a couple other committees that are and some of the and the city council has been talking about bringing back the council meetings um, in this month. Oh, they're going to vote on it this month. Yeah. We are the pioneers, so in many ways. <laughs> All right. Um, great. So we have, there's another, do we want to discuss the second one about the, uh, uh, three, the yep. attachment? That's on the public hearing as well. Okay. <laughs> So the next item is 350 attachment to, uh, oof, I'll let you under, help to explain that. Yeah. So amendment for the URB and the URC tables um, under the category of uses by right in each of those tables. Um, so it, it just adds, um, so we have an allowance by right is reduced lot line uh, for single pin the proposal is to say reduce lot line for single or two families so long as the two units are under a single roof structure. Um, the the rationale behind this proposed amendment is that two th two and a half years ago, when and then going back twenty years um, when we had zero lot line for single family homes. Uh, the definition of single family home also included an uh, accessory dwelling. So if you wanted to build an accessory dwelling as part of your single family home by zoning, we still looked at it as a single family home, even though there were two units. So two years ago, we um, modified the uh, accessory dwellings um, section and just um, created a two family standard so that everywhere in the city, two family, two families were allowed. Um, and, um, uh, around that same time, we also amended zero lot line and changed it to reduce lot line. There were uh, several ch uh, changes that were, um, that were put forward to city council based on comments from the neighborhoods and, and concern about the way the old zero lot line, uh, was laid out. So those modifications were put forward to address those concerns. But it inadvertently left out the allowance for a second unit 
you know, within the same roof structure, essentially, as what had previously been allowed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this, this is all this is doing. But to, I, to specify that it's, you still have to be on one roof. So it's not like you can, you know, add a detached structure because we call that two family too. Um, it's really meant to sort of go back to the way it had been where, um, a, an accessory dwelling within or as part of under the same sort of footprint of a single family could be done by by right. We had some strange situations in the past where two dwellings were connected by like a breezeway mm -hmm. and a roof. Yeah. Um, we don't see that anymore. Um, well, we could see that, especially in a two family, if people really sort of want to have separate so walls. Yeah. So actually, this is a question for, for an architect. Um, does this language sort of ensure that that kind of thing doesn't happen? If it says it's under one roof? You're saying one roof structure. Uh, yeah. I guess in the lawsuit, you could start arguing for like, well, is it? I mean, what do you think when you read that? I read it as duplex, basically. But under one under one roof, right? Not like not like under two but roofs like connected by a, a pipe breezeway. connecting them, but that's one roof, right? Is that what you're right, saying? right. I meant more like roof then you drop down and you have a breezeway and then another structure that wouldn't be under one roof right <clears throat> i don't know i mean we talked about can you put a breezeway in just to make it by the letter of the law one roof i don't know but if but when you call that three roofs there's no laws in architecture <laughs> that's why we're law. zoning so fine <laughs> put it in the zoning as a definition if, if, if okay. you want to not allow that i guess i guess my question is do you not want to allow that i don't know who cares well, I mean, that's a well, I guess the issue is it doesn't one of them trigger a review and one doesn't. Well, the issue is um, there was a concern when um, about whether someone might use the zero lot line because you're closer to this the side lot on one side of the property to add multiple buildings on the parcel. And so the idea is to limit it to a single family. But um, you have 120 foot single house where you have 250 foot with a 20 foot breezeway, like it's yeah. one person than the other. Like, why would you want to limit? I don't know why people would want to do that in the climate, honestly, but like they wanted to. Like, why is that? Is it more of a nuisance or something to their neighbor? Not particularly. Yeah, I, I can think of a couple of examples around town where that has happened, but it certainly seems that I guess they blend in most. Yeah. most I mean, I guess, ways. I mean, it's, I guess it would be comparable to sort of the rambling farmhouse anyway, you know, mm. that keeps you keep adding on yeah. and adding on. Um, Wouldn't it be yeah. had a duplex that was a single structure and then they took the entryway that was and then they demolished the entryway and made it an open greenway? Would it suddenly become illegal? I mean, it seems kind of fine. Oh, yeah. I don't see what the okay. problem. The, um, but isn't there a difference in a to have two family as detached versus two family as single building? Doesn't it come to us? Yes. Differently? Yes, true. If it's detached, it would That's have what to I come. This was about. Yeah, no, no, no. But I guess if it's a zero lot line, it will come to us either way. Zero lot lines are allowed by right, but if you're doing, but but if you wanted to do two units, I mean, I guess this would say, okay, if you want to do detached units. As your accessory dwelling, it's not allowed. That's what this would say. Unless you because it's not under one roof. Yeah, unless you just put a big roof that connected the two structures together. Right. Which is what and then you wouldn't come back to planning board anyway. Right. So you'd have something that looked like two houses with a tunnel between them. Yeah. Or a walkway between them. And do do we do we have a problem with that? Well, it's more like if you have a house that is conforming and it obeys the normal plot line, but then you're going to add 
second family as an attached addition, but that one's going to put or reduce that one. That's a that's a that's a visual giant see a lot because just like where the house happened to be, the only place to build it and you really only want to put it or into the lot line on the side. Well, don't forget you can't do zero or reduced lot line unless you own both sides of that side lot line. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So then I suppose in that case it doesn't matter because if you're 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 setting it up for that and you've um, you own both sides and it's not detached anyway. Um, I mean, I guess the under single roof structure would mean that you couldn't do a, an accessory, a detached accessory dwell, dwelling using zero lot line. So right. it seems well, pretty well, clear. It seems like it's easier to do well, like a one over one townhouse, like two, four, like a two mm -hmm. story flats townhouse, which is a good building type. Yeah. Right. And it would still meet that. Okay. So I suppose we've gone around in a circle. <laughs> no. Or two parts. It's fine. No, the part I don't really know, like about the single structure. Single structure, but maybe it's fine. Okay. Like it's so long, like it is. Yep. Okay. Um. Sandwich <laughs> signs in front of these. Food truck. Can you park your food truck in the freezer? <laughs> That's what you could do with the freezer. Um, and I'm sorry, we closed the public hearing earlier, but this is a separate, separate public hearing. hearing. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to come forward and speak to this two family uh, duplex situation? Or do we have anybody in the, I don't see any the Zoom room? Any chats? Okay. Hearing none, seeing none. Uh, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Let's close the public hearing. Second. Motion to remain seconded, close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, all those opposed? Unanimous. All right, is there a motion about recommending 23.247 to clarify reduced lot line uses? Do it. Thank you. I will move to recommend 23.247 ordinance to clarify reduced lot line uses allowed by right. Very good. Is there a second? Thank you, Stacey. Any discussion? We beat this one up. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. And no opposed. Unanimous again, Carol. Yeah. So the only thing is the other that I have. And and just in terms of the ones that we're not recommending, they're not zoning ordinances, but you did attach them about the the scooters, and we're changing the language to make sure it reflects Florence Village discussion, the Florence Village Center. I don't know if anybody has any questions about those that they want to raise. A lot of it's just language around the Florence Village District. Okay. So now we're moving down to our other category. <clears throat> so I had on there in the committee assignments. Yep. Um, you typically do that in the spring. <laughs> um, and so I, what I didn't, what I forgot to send you was the co subcommittee list. So I'm just gonna pull it up here. Um, give me a second. Oh boy. I brought this up with Carolyn just cause we've had uh, some changes in our membership. Um, and uh, David had brought up uh, his his participation in the committee that he's on or the, these are like out, outside commitments. Okay. So as uh so we did this January 2022. Um so we have four committees, but there's also housing partnership that could have a slot. Um 
So we have Capital Improvements Committee, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Tech Review, um, Community Preservation, and then um, periodically there are other projects that you might um, just decide to review or participate in as a whole. And then there's Housing Partnership, which um, I, for the last several years, um, the board has decided not to have a representative to go regularly to those meetings, but just to have sort of staff liaison between the two committees. So Keith uh, Benoit in our office is the staff um, person that um, that um, runs or helps facilitate the housing partnership um, committee. Um, so those are the sort of five categories. So um, capital improvements just meets basically September to November. So they're done for this year. Um, and their the members are appointed. Um, um, by the mayor officially. So Melissa, you yep. are on that, right? Yep. And I'll, I'll stay on that. If, okay. If somebody I else think, isn't dying to do it. Isn't there a meeting coming up on Zoom? Zoom about the CIP? Yeah, so now it's gone on, like now it's going through its process. Right. So, right. Right. so you. I don't know about that meeting. No, I think, so the committee is formed to sort of evaluate the projects and yep. then send the recommendations along. Right. 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 We and ranked everything yeah. and gave our recommendations <laughs> to the mayor. Yeah. So now the public or the, the department heads are starting that process again for the next fiscal year. Um, that won't start again till next year. So we're still in it for so we're moving see. forward to the I through see. the council process and I then see. it starts again in the fall. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Sure. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. So I'll keep doing that. Um Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. David is a member. Wayne is the alternate. Was the alternate. Um, so that one is definitely open, <laughs> the alternate position. <laughs> so are you the are you you're the alternate, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> What's that? I'd be happy to relieve you. <laughs> well, before you give away the alternate, I, I've had a lot of trouble uh, getting to the meetings. I mean, there's Zoom meetings. They're not there every other month, maybe something like that. I've just said I've been so busy. I have not. I've missed a couple and. They also almost always conflict with this meeting. <laughs> so I usually end up, they're usually at like five. Seven on or, two, I think. Yeah. Maybe they're like at 6 p.m. or something, something like that. Um, so I, I mean, so, all the meetings, like is it all so towns with, and. Yeah, mm -hmm. so all towns in the Pioneer Valley region, um, they send a rep from the planning, their planning boards. And then, um, and then usually staff officials are alternates or sometimes sit in. So, um, so I think it would probably make sense for me to be the alternate again and have a board member there because mm -hmm. it's really. And then you just well, David can explain as well. But they, um, you know, there are different issues on the agendas for each month. There's a lot of informational things they bring people in to talk about statewide issues or like i mean it's like every region of the state has a planning and it's basically like yeah. when they give the money out like these are the organizations that figure it all well the map out of, and most of are passed through they don't um but like like with the federal money that came through like this the, the legislature and the governor both sent people to talk about how there are different visions of giving out the money or um and then there's also a governance thing that the the the, the the board members from the different towns technically vote on like approving the budget, I think, even of, of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And there's a lot of like inside, like how much soap are we going to buy for the bathroom? <laughs> this kind of stuff too. I mean, that's not most of it, but but most of it is. <laughs> but there's interesting stuff. And, and I think um, it's important for Northampton because I think um, the huge range of different issues from different towns, you can imagine. Um, and um, some of the things happening in Northampton um, were sort of in some ways like 10 years into the future with some of the decisions that the other towns are making. So I think it's important, but I just don't have time. 
a, a big thing I think is that tip, the transportation improvement plan where they put out five years what the priorities are in the region and Northampton always has something in that basket, you know, that we want. Yeah, that's going on right now, yeah. Yeah. Are you interested, yeah. Stacey? Yeah. Okay. No? It's great. Thank you very much. I will send your name to them. Okay. And it's a relatively new uh, executive director, right? Two years now or? Yeah, I think two years. Yeah. yeah, she came from Colorado. I haven't met her yet. Yeah, just before coming. Yeah. Okay, so then we also have this uh, technical review committee so we can have one person come to that that's sort of that's the preliminary sort of staff review of projects that might come forward but they've been they've de been developed enough to have a concept and it's a way to get fire building um, issues about economic development housing planning zoning conservation commission sort of all um, and stormwater and utilities, sort of all those um, elements um, in the room at once for the applicants to understand what's going to be expected of them when they apply, to try to make sure that we um, don't have, um, there aren't unexpected things that they haven't addressed. I mean, that doesn't always work, but we try to do that to um, make sure those things get taken care of. These are for bigger projects. So the, the group meets as needed um, and it's the third Tuesday and it's a morning meeting. If we have two projects, we start at 7.30 to 8.30. So it's just really quick sort of run through the projects. If it's just one, we'll start at eight before the work day so that folks who have other things to do can carry on. So. George, uh, Sam had been the primary person and George was the backup. And the reason being that, you know, if for some reason someone couldn't make it, it would still be good to have a uh, planning board perspective. Is Sam still planning to do it or does he want to step down? I don't know. I haven't had a conversation with him. He did. He did. There he did. He did. There you go. Tuesday. Yeah. Yes. So. You must yeah. still want to do it. That's a hint. You still want to do it. Then. And he didn't say, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. He's okay. not here to do so. All right. I'm sticking with it. Good. <laughs> and I'll stick with it as his, as his sub. Okay. okay. I feel like if he had been coming against his will, you would have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we have CPC. How's that going, Jana? Um, sorry to spring you this on you at this meeting, but um, I saw it on the agenda anyway. I am also having some scheduling difficulties. I've been able to make it, but I'm I would be happy if somebody else could take over my spot because um, it's getting in the way of some other yeah. things that I have going on. And, and, and explain that one. The CPC is is the um, Community Preservation Committee, so we have. Uh, Northampton and many communities around the state have passed the CPA, the Community Preservation Act, which allows us to levy a local tax that then um, we use the funds to make awards for projects in affordable housing. Ooh, I'm going to forget the yeah, list. Keep going, come on. <laughs> preservation. Thank you. Open space. Thank you. Yes, those. Um, so there's two award cycles, one in the fall, one in the spring, um, where applicants, you know, submit applications, we send back questions, we hear from them, we meet with the public, and then we make recommendations and the city council officially, um, awards the funds. Occasionally there are summer meetings if there's small or, um, kind of urgent applications, time sensitive applications, but mostly it's kind of September to November, December, and then February to May. And it's uh second and fourth Wednesday. Kind of depends how many applications there are, how long the process takes. So the fall one kind of runs in the same period as as the the one I'm on. Capital improvement. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> And I'd I'd be interested in helping out. I just it's I, I it seems like the fall ones may conflict. Okay. Because we had a we had a ton of meetings inside of a month 
Yeah, yeah, it gets pretty intense. And, uh, this can be pretty intense too with reading applications and going on site visits and then. Yeah. David and I both had the opportunity to serve on it. <clears throat> yeah. It's good because you're always making people happy pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. and it's a good good group, very engaged membership. There's It's a combination of uh, reps from other committees, elected members, and appointed members, I think. So it's kind of an interesting makeup as a body, and everybody's really um, engaged. So there's lots of robust discussion, which is wonderful and also yeah. takes up a fair amount of time. Yeah, right. <laughs> So is it mostly Zoom meetings still? Or? We're all we've been on Zoom. So I've been this is my second year doing it and it's been on Zoom the whole time and they seem happy about that. So I suspect that that will continue for that group as long as it's allowed is my sense right now. I can try to take it. I don't know that I have time, but I can just see how it goes. <laughs> You're in the middle of the cycle. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'll finish this cycle. So it would be um and i could continue through the summer as well it's really starting in the fall that um when my work pick back, picks back up again that's when i'd like to switch out so so yeah there are yeah. two rounds each year and sometimes they're heavier or lighter um yeah. depending on you know what projects are being proposed and my summer is super busy but Maybe I'm ramping down in the fall a little bit. Yeah, I can continue through the summer. And usually there's, I mean, if the summer there's anything, it's like one meeting. It's pretty quiet. So it's if someone's having an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, that sounds great, Chris. Let's see how you're doing that in the fall. If it doesn't work out, you know, I could offer to take over the CIP. So you could do the CPC and then we'll have the ZBA for the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. You've got to like okay, put a plan. Uh, the last committee was the affordable housing. Right. So, and then again, I put a little bug in. Um, Alan Burson, some of you remember, he was on the um, the planning board for a while with us, and he was the rep, the last rep to the uh, affordable housing group. But um, <clears throat> wasn't he also CPC? Mm, I don't think I so. I thought I took over his. Let's Oh, he might have dropped a housing partnership to go to CPC. Yeah. No, and then I took over the CPC. I think you took over from me. Okay. Well, have we had? A, I don't remember ever having an update from any of their meetings though. In these, no. Have we ever had one? Do they have meetings? Like, how often do they meet? Uh huh. Um, so they've been working a lot on recently on on different kind of legislation. So. The, the, they oversaw a process to um, evaluate um, burdens to or barriers to housing through MPVPC did this report that came up with a bunch of recommendations to address housing in Northampton. And so they've been um, taking those recommendations and seeing if they can, mm -hmm. you know, um, push them forward. So one of the recommendations was about this um, broker fee um, idea that um, that um, that should be there should be a local petition home rule petition to um, not allow brokerage fees for rentals they're working on they also are interested in supporting another potential mechanism for funding affordable housing so th that's sort of what they've been working on recently this came up on cpc a number of times too where they were doing a lot of work, but we never really heard what they were doing. And so there was talk about should we send somebody or have them come to CPC and report or, you know, because it's kind of like this semi public private group of, I mean, it's an interesting, it's just very interesting. A lot of people know a lot. Huh. Yeah, they meet once, um, they meet, um, forgetting that, um, they meet on Mondays. Is that right, um, Nathan? The third Monday. Studies board commission. Yeah, no, no, no. The um, housing partnership. Oh, oh. <laughs> it is a Monday. It's second or third Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was on it quite a while ago, back in uh, aughts. That we call two thousand, like two thousand and four. <clears throat> um, and it was pretty, pretty active then. Um, and I and I found it really helpful, and I think they found it helpful to have somebody at the, from the planning board talk about some of the permitting process and affordable housing and, and how that worked from the planning board's perspective. So 
you know, there, I think there is a, a place there for good kind of cross communication. Yeah. And I think it would be good. Uh, I think it's good to also, I think there could be a lot more advocacy for housing just in general, not just affordable housing. And so to the extent that they sort of really understand um, more than just the, you know, question about affordable housing um, and participate in that conversation, it would be um, probably beneficial for both committees. Um, there were a couple of members came, or at least the chair came for Valley CDC's project. Yep. Um, but, you know, we think it probably makes sense to do more of that, not just the habitats or Valley CDC right. projects. Right. Yeah. Just I think it's Monday, the first, first Monday of the month. Oh, the first, the second, third. One of the Mondays. So I, I'd be happy to do that unless you wanted to do it and I could take over the VIP. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> It's, good. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Well, I so if the okay. chair can volunteer to do that. Okay. So I'll put you in for housing partnership, George? Sure. Great. I'll get here. I'll link you with Keith so that you can get on the okay. email. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. So we meet again in a year and right we we haven't done a good job of putting like report backs like for the pvpc little agenda items where david could tell us what they talked about or you know uh, often the cpc we get to read about that in the local paper or hear about it some of the bigger projects um but yeah you know, but cip we don't know what's going on so you can give us a lesson next time around <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. Um, and then we have January minutes. The only one missing that day, Jana and Sam weren't available that day. Um, it was just a, a, a discussion. There was no permit. It was a discussion on uh, maybe affordable housing. <laughs> Inclusionary zoning. Yeah. So everybody had a chance to look at that. I scanned them quickly. I didn't see any typos, any errors. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you. A second. All right. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes of January, was it the 8th? 26th. 26th. That was my point right. day. <laughs> all right. All right. Well done. Unanimous. January 26th. Okay, and we have one A and R at uh, the thirty-one thirty-three. So, um, subdivision approval not required it comes to you when a new subdivision is not being created, but there either is a new lot being created that has fronted legal frontage on a street. Or if there's land swaps, then um, it has to come through the A&R process because uh, required by statute. So in this case, um, there's this, uh, this parcel here is comprised actually of two lot, or this lot is comprised of two tracks. And then there's this other parcel here. So there's just a little uh, land swap between um, you know, a triangle from here going this triangle from there to go there um, to accommodate, you know, the driveway that's sort of, uh, this used to be, well, still is all in common ownership, the three parcels. So at the time that these were built, the owner didn't really care what the driveway was, just kind of put the driveway to the house and the lot line sort of right down the middle. So that's sort of the, that's the only reason for these two small, triangular so pieces. Where, where the so this, this one goes to there, this one goes to there. And Are they equal areas? Like 15. Yeah. One, 160 feet versus like 135. And which lot's getting bigger after this swap? <laughs> Looks like. <laughs> We're going to quiz you on this next month. <laughs> Here we go. 
Well, this lot is getting more land. Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't say it's getting bigger. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's getting bigger by 15 feet, but this yeah. is still the bigger lot. <laughs> right. So. But when it's getting more area in yeah. it and one's getting the less. The goal is only to determine whether or not there's a subdivision. So that's and then just out of curiosity, which is not related at all to ANRs, but if a parcel changes its shape uh -huh. and it's in a zoning district, does the zoning district continue to stay within the shape of the new parcel or does the zoning district follow a different line the zoning district is completely separate from lot lines okay so you can chop up all of your lot lines you want zoning comes down and overlays on top of it yep. and stays okay. and the lines can switch any which way in between at any time mm -hmm. um there's and, many parcels that are in multiple zoning right, districts right. yeah there's multiple. and the part of the parcel that's in the zoning district that's the zoning that governs for that part of the parcel um or is there, it a weighted average there are rules that um, go just to that, um, and it depends. So it um, it's where the pri the the uses governed are those that are where most of the land sits. It's the majority of the yes, and then person. there's different, slightly different rules. So there's also split zones that cross municipal boundaries, right? So West Hampton, East Hampton, completely different zoning codes. So when you cross the line, you go into a different zoning district, but it's the same lot. But your land in West Hampton, um, that side is governed by West Hampton. The land, the portion of the property you own in Northampton is um, for whatever's going on on that piece is governed by Northampton. But when the total, if you're looking at sort of build out of the total, it's wherever most of the land lies. Um, is for the allowed uses. Allowed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But then the setbacks are based on the zone where that piece is. Where yeah. the land itself mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So you can have a rear setback that jogs when it crosses the yes. zoning line, yep. for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, it has nothing to do with the zoning <clears throat> class, um, zoning district boundaries. Um, and so let me just clarify, because our two people who spoke at the public comment were certainly speaking about this larger um, picture. So, mm -hmm. but this isn't a public hearing around ANRs. It's an administrative review. Your jurisdiction is only limited to looking at whether a parcel has frontage, if in the case you're creating a new lot, um, or if uh, and. Um, whether this would constitute a subdivision. You can't look at zoning, you can't look at anything else. And, this... and it doesn't matter what any use is now on the property or in the future. As long, I mean, the only thing that can that I can do or you could do when you see an A&R that comes in that might create a line that would create a non-conforming structure, you can mark the plan, or you can write whatever you want on the plan, but you can't deny, you can't say that this is a subdivision and therefore you're not gonna sign the plan, but you can write notes all that you want on the plan and say, this building is now non-conforming and that will cause a problem for the person who sort of be, who wants to draw a lot line, let's say, right down the middle of the house. Um, that's going to create a legal nonconformity. And so you can flag it, but you can't, I mean, you can't refuse to sign the AR plan if it meets the standards and the subdivision rules for an AR. So what you're showing us there is the existing lot for metrics before it was knocked down. Is that the metrics building there? Yes. And the other thing is you don't really, they don't, they don't have to show the buildings on the property either for an ANR. Okay. Okay. Other questions? I move to endorse the ANR on Chapel Street. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second by Melissa. All right, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of endorsing the ANR on Chapel Street? Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming tonight.
that about wraps up our business. On March 8th, I want to thank everybody out there in Zoom for joining us. They're still away. Ben. It's still early. It's a record. So I we adjourn? Move, we adjourn, yeah. Uh, Moses, second. Moses are made to adjourn at 8.15. Um, um, can I just, um, I'm sorry, I didn't see that you were adjourning. There was a couple of comments that came in. Uh, sorry. Um, just a question. I just want to acknowledge they came yep. in. Um, is the proposal going to only govern the changes to existing structures or the new structure as well? There's no new, so we talked about that. There's no new structure. You're not looking at any new structure. And if the builder doesn't want the swap and the neighbors object, why does the planning board want to approve? Um, uh, the PV URV swap. So, um, Applications come in. You you're actually obligated by um, the law to respond within 21 days. So unless the applicant withdraws an application, the applicant doesn't have to file this A and R, right? They don't have to record it. They don't have to record it. So they can do what they want with it. They could tear it up if they want. Right, but you have to legally respond within 21 days, or de facto becomes. To be clear, it's not a PV URV swap. No, it's not. Nope. It's purely a it's lot, a lot line swap. It's a lot line swap. The theoretically would be a change of ownership, except it's the same owner here. Exactly. So okay. Yep. There's no swap. There's no change in the mm -hmm. swap. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. I just didn't see. No, that. that's that's okay. That's the the little downside to running these hybrid meetings. Is we we're kind of focused here on the real people, and we we miss what I don't think we technically take comments on A and R's anyway. So yes, yeah, yeah, very good of you to do that. But <laughs> we try to be transparent for our residents here, Anthony. So we didn't want the voting on the adjourning anyway, so it didn't help. Ah, it's still part of so our. It's yeah. no, we, we got it right in there. So <laughs> um, we'll amend that motion to adjourn to uh, eight seventeen. Objection, objection. Janet and Chris. Janet and Chris. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.